Excellent. Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. I'm shaking that water glass everywhere. Um, so next up, uh, Martin Alfke is going to talk about the power of Puppet 4. Um, so I hope you folks are excited to learn a little bit more about Puppet 4. And uh, with that, Martin. Thank you. So welcome to Puppet Camp Berlin. Um, since Nigel did all the technical polls already, uh, right in his first talk, uh, I decided, okay, since I like polls, I have to decide, okay, which poll is it that I will do? And I decided to do a language poll. Who of the people in here does not understand German? That's quite a bunch of people. Okay, which definitely uh, makes me not asking the next question, so I will do the talk in English, so to get everybody will get an understanding. So, yeah, the power of Puppet 4. Uh, within the next, well, 30, 40, 50 minutes, rest of the day, I will nag you with information about what's new in Puppet 4. This will be the interesting stuff for you, where you will eagerly look forward on what is new. And, of course, there's also a section, uh, Power of Puppet 4, with great power comes great responsibility. There will be lots of stuff where you need to do work for getting your, your code ready for Puppet 4. So, my name is Martin. I'm uh, living here in Berlin since nine years by now. I'm one of the Puppet Labs trainings partners. So with Puppet Labs has many training partners amongst all of the world, so I'm the one, I'm one of the, the partners here located in Berlin, in Germany. Um, I'm contributing to quite a bunch of modules uh, within the actual project. We even have released one module as open source on, on GitHub and on the module forge. And I'm, I w at the moment I'm still working as a freelancer. Uh, this will hopefully change by July 1st. And no, we are not looking for hires, but we are looking for puppet freelancers. And when one would have asked me, let's say four or five years ago, uh, what is your profession? What is it that you're doing? I would definitely have told them, oh, I'm a system administrator. Don't call me a developer. Developer is something different. I'm doing other stuff. I'm a system administrator. Meanwhile, things have changed by just using Puppet in general. Um, because a system administrator SSHs into a machine and check whether something is working or not, doing modification to configuration files, emptying log files because of full disk and stuff like that. And uh, this is something where nowadays say, when I have to SSH into a system, there are two, either one of two or both things broken, the deployment or the monitoring. So nowadays, I'm saying, no, a system administrator is someone who logs SSH into a system, analyzes the system, doing changes to the system. That is the reason why I say, no, I'm no longer a system administrator. I'm more a kind like an infrastructure engineer, infrastructure architect. I define the system, I define the states of the system by using Puppet. So first, welcome to Puppet 4. Uh, April 15th, a couple of days ago, the first 4.0.0 release was released. Um, there's also some blog posting about it, and there's also documentation already updated. Uh, I already saw the first uh, bug report regarding the documentation, pointing to elder versions of the documentation. So hopefully this will get fixed soon, and you find all the proper information regarding Puppet 4. Well, this is not the only welcome, I have to say, because 10 years ago, in 2005, Puppet was founded. It was not Puppet Labs, they had another name at the, for the company. But, so Puppet itself is now a system which is in place for 10 years. So definitely it's a point where we need bigger changes in a software that exists, that exists for 10 years. So what is it that I'm going to talk about? There are many things and some things Nigel already described. I will go a little bit more in a technical background. First, we have the new Puppet server and the way how Puppet is packaged at all. So the new Puppet server is running on Clojure on a JVM. Uh, Puppet Labs also adopted uh, a technology they call Trapper Keeper by switching on and off certain functionality within the Puppet Master. So switching on the file serving on one Puppet Master because it only compiles catalogs, switching on the CA on one Puppet Master and disabling all the other, rust, all the other stuff of the Puppet Master, which makes it easier for you to, uh, to load balance amongst different functionalities of Puppet Masters. 
Then, of course, you have within the J JMX console, you get uh, information uh, regarding the health state of your JVM, how is the heap size used. And within the Puppet Enterprise version, you even get internal metrics from the Puppet Master. The other thing is which changed is the packaging. Um, there was some discussion on the mailing list whether this is good or not. Uh, personally, I first said, ah, this is going to become ugly. Uh, well, after thinking about it, I said, yes, it makes it easier for me to maintain systems, multiple different systems, and having one functional Puppet version in place. Uh, the first thing they said, uh, we will have all-in-one packages. So what is this all-in-one packages? What does that mean? Uh, in the elder times, you have to take care that you have a proper Ruby version on your Puppet Master, on your Puppet Agent. So the agent is fully functional. The Ruby version should be new enough to not have memory leaks. Um, so 1.8.7, lower patch level. Nigel told me once, 299? 299, yeah. They have a feature built in. It calls them, it's called a memory leak. So when you have a Puppet Master running on that version, yeah, don't yeah, just put the memory into the machine. Ruby will eat it, so no problem at all. So, so it was difficult. Uh, what is it when we have a far more newer system that provides a far more newer version of Ruby and we need an older one? So we had to do some kind of backporting older versions in a build process to have them packaged on our Puppet Master Puppet Agent. Hmm. Sounds insane, something I would not like to maintain. So Puppet Labs decided to do a similar approach they have done in Puppet Enterprise to Puppet Open Source. In the Enterprise version, you get all the software you needed bundled into one place. It's installed in one location. It brings uh, the proper Ruby version, a tested Ruby version, the uh, required GAM set is available. Um, you even have Java uh, in, inside for running, um, for example, the Puppet DB and the new Puppet server. And within the new agent, Open Source agent, they've said it's similar. We will provide proper Ruby versions and we will not install them into the system Ruby location, but we will install them into a separate directory structure, into our Puppet Labs. So, so the first thing is the packaging, the way how the packaging is done and the way how the software is bundled. The next thing is package names. Um, since many people I know who's using directly the repositories from Puppet Labs in their production system. Wow, like, I mentioned, uh, like someone mentioned on the DevOps days uh, earlier this year, you're having unprotected sex with the internet. <laughs> so people who have uh, somehow a repository copy in the internal network, checking MD5 sums and stuff like that, uh, they, they, they can control when will they update their Puppet version by just updating their local repository copy. So what if someone just says, no, I'm using the Puppet Labs repository server, and now there's Puppet 4 out. So you will immediately get Puppet 4 on your masters and agents. Is that something you would like to do? So Puppet Labs is doing the changes on your platform by just updating their repositories? Or would you like to control when this update will happen? Yeah, but it's only Puppet, so it should work. It should continue working. Will it? We'll see. So we have new package names. We have new repository layout to not have automatic updates to Puppet 4 just by having a new version available in a repository. So now we come to the technology which is built in. Um, since the early days, Puppet offered the possibility to have environments in your system. So the system administrator of the Puppet Master was eagerly having, oh no, don't, don't cope with my production environment. Dear developer, you will get an environment by yourself. There you can test stuff. We will provide proper use of the proper versions of the software you need. And when all the testing is done properly, then we will merge that into the production branch, uh, the production tree on the Puppet Master. So he did a Manual configuration in the Puppet Conf, adding a section for testing. Yeah. And the next developer showed up. Hey, I've heard we can have environments on the master. I'd like to have environment too. So the administrator of the Puppet Master, either when managing via Puppet, added a new line to the configuration file manually or automatically, however. So the next came and said, we need a separate environment because we have to test the version we have provided to that customer and we have to provide a fix for that. We need an environment for that specific version. So one day the system administrator said, this is really ugly. There are three people showing up per day where I have to add environments manually to the PuppetConf. Why should I do so? 
So he says, hey, give the environment just any name. I'm fine with that. And within the Puppet configuration file, he just said, hey, I'm using the environment variable. So if a node would like to switch environment, he just says environments equal, equal, uh, equals and just a name. And you, dear developer, just have a branch and uh, check it out at the proper location. More like this? OK. Uh, you, you, might, you might make me notice about that three or four times, approximately. Okay. Yeah, but somehow the people learned, hmm, OK, now we have individual automatic environments available. But what we don't have is per environment configuration. We still have a global configuration. And this is where the directory environments comes into, comes into place. So on the master, you just specify no longer a module path, but an environment path. You specify your master where to find all the environments. And within each environment, you can have one configuration file, an environment.conf configuration file, where you say, on that specific environment, I will, for example, specify a different config version that has to be shown. I want to specify whether the future parser should be turned on or off, like Nigel explained it. We now can do it per environment, future parsing on or off. And the other thing which comes handy when using directory-based environments is the usage of R10K. Um, so the story I've read about how this funny name came up was the developer doing the code and uh, someone told him, oh, you have to find a name for it. Uh, it's, it's a great idea, we want to provide it to public and uh, you find a name for it, you have to, have to find a name for it. Yeah, and he thought about it and in his blog post he says, yes, he's uh, good at coding but bad at naming. And so he remembered, ah, there was once an IRC bot called uh, Robot 9000. And he just says, okay, I'll just add 1000. So I have Robot 10000, which is shortly named R10K. So within R10K, you're working with Git branches. In each branch, you will have a Puppet file. Within the Puppet file, you describe which modules and which versions would you like to have in that branch, and the branch reflects to an environment on the Puppet Master. So this is not really new. It's out already for quite some time. It's now bundled in the, in the enterprise version, so the enterprise version now also has R10K included right from scratch. You don't have to install it later on. But there's even more, there's new language features, so new stuff that is inside Puppet. The first thing is the lambdas. They offered lambdas, the way to deal with data. So you say you have a certain block and you can use functions on that block. And there are quite a couple of functions available. So in the older times when you had somehow an array and you want to iterate over the elements of an array, you couldn't do that in Puppet directly, in Puppet DSL. You either did that in your templates, where you have the possibility of using Ruby, um, or you have written, hopefully you don't, you have written uh, Puppet uh, classes in, in Ruby to have the power of Ruby available. This is something we now don't need anymore. It's all related to the type system. Since Puppet now knows this is an array, this is a hash map, then Puppet knows, okay, now I know I can deal, have certain functions available for that specific data type. So this is only a small subset of all the functions that are available. Um, what is more important with these new functions, you can continue using them in the same way like you have used the functions so far. So normally you just say, uh, what I always tell the people in the training, uh, they see something they don't understand, so there's something like a string, st letters, then there's the round bracelet opening, then there is something or not, and then it's closing again. Yeah, this is a puppet function. It's executed on the master. So you can, for example, each use the each function on a certain variable. Hopefully it's an array, otherwise you will get an error. And you can do it the Ruby way by chaining the variable and the function by putting a dot, inside, dot in between. So both options are possible now. Something which is also new is the EPP template engine. So far, we only had one template engine, the ERB template engine, which is the built-in Ruby template engine. And for people, it was always confusing that they say, in Puppet, I have a variable with a dollar sign. And in those templates, I either have to use an add, the scope lookup var function, or the scope function to, to look for variables. Why isn't it similar? 
why do I have to change the things, how, how it is working? How do I write it down? So with the embedded puppet template engine, you have the possibility of using the variables in the same way like you use them in Puppet. You don't have to add the at in front of it or any kind of the scope functions. And you use it like you use ERB templates. So with ERB you have the template function, with EPP you have the EPP function, with ERB you have the inline template function, with EPP you have the inline, EP, inline EPP function. So no big differences besides the way how you write code, how you write variables in the templates. I know some people who would like to manage Puppet configuration files by providing the content inside the DSL. And this always looks like a complete nightmare because uh, you have all these nice tabs, two, two soft white spaces uh, added to all your Puppet code. And then there is this multi-line stuff starting somewhere and then going to the first sign of the line and then you continue the text. So Puppet now offers also the support for HereDoc. So similar to shell, you can just provide an, a sign, okay, this is the code until this sign arrives. You can with a pipe say, okay, the code you use starts at this point, so you still have readable puppet code. And similar to the ERB EPP template engine, you have the minus sign that prevents the printout of new line. You can use, use your, um, your, your end of file, your, your last, uh, what, what is the, 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 the identifier until where I'm looking for, for code to get edit, edit uh, put it in double colons and you get a variable substitution. And you can do uh, character escaping which defaults to off. Within Puppet 4 we also have a new some kind of hierarchy. I would not make it related to Hira as a hierarchy itself. Um, we still have Hira in place unchanged. But we now have two more ways where we can provide data. Maybe that's not interesting for people who write their Puppet code for their platform, but for people who contribute to Puppet code or he, people who manage, maintain Puppet modules on GitHub or the Module Forge. Because it makes it easier for users um, to set, for example, certain variable packages. So you normally you have the params PP pattern and modules where you identify like on which operating system do I have to use which package name. Package name change changes amongst different multiple operating systems. Now you can put that in an approach which is similar to Hira and do it by having the automatic data lookup. You just provide a new way of data because you say no, we have an Apache, yes, but it has another name because it's an in-house developed version. It's a hardened version of Apache. We have compiled everything in, no modules anymore, for example. The real big thing which I personally believe is new and really powerful in Puppet is the type system. Like Nigel mentioned, so far we only had strings. Everything was a string. So, and so just remember the case, the famous SSH module example. Uh, you've written an SSH module and one of your um, system administrator colleagues shows up and says, uh, hey, um, your, your, your module is fine, it stalls SSH server everywhere, but we have certain systems where we would not like to have the server installed, only the agent. Can you please provide us a module uh, which does a similar approach by not, a similar approach configuring SSH but not installing the daemon and running the daemon? So you will say, okay, I will not write another module because now I have two different codes to maintain. I will make you a parameterized class and uh, will offer you a parameter. The parameter dollar server. And you say for a default so that it doesn't, uh, does it, so that I don't mess up with my existing platform, I put it to true. I have the server installed everywhere. Okay, so you tell your colleague, hey, it's quite easy, just use the class with proper parameters. So your colleague uses the class with proper parameters. Setting server to false. Yes, but it's a string. So what will happen? Uh, he will show up immediately to the desk and say, hey, you have done nothing. It still installs the server. And you have to dig around where's the problem with my module until you know it's in another way. My colleague used it the wrong way. Okay, in the old times you learned it by, okay, I will use functions from standard library. I will validate the data. So yeah, validate dollar server still set to a string, which content, so validates to true. 
So isn't even the proper solution. Hmm. Okay, there's string to bool, for example. You might have used that one. But that's an easy example. What about hashes? Ah, we offered our, our HR department to put our new users just into Hira. So, and they're adding data, and they're typing and typing and managing home systems, uh, home directories, user IDs, uh, usernames, and uh, how many errors are there inside? Uh, five, yeah. Well, you've seen it, so in an easy way, it's difficult to see that there are many errors inside. So this is the reason why it says, yes, we don't, we don't only want types, we need types in Puppet. Because we now give the power of what our module is doing to, so to an external source, and we can't work, we, we, can't, we can tell them, please put in proper data. But maybe they don't understand the term data at all. Maybe they don't know about types. But you still want to be sure that your Puppet module is functional in the way you expect it to be. And the safe way is when someone provides wrong data in a wrong type, just fail out of the module and don't do anything because you don't know what else will happen when using wrong data types. So we now have something like the Boolean type where we can check for whether the dollar server variable is a Boolean. And when now our users start using our module with wrong data types, the Puppet Master will throw an error, the client will, the agent will receive the error, it will be printed out, it will be in the report. Everybody sees immediately, ah, okay, the module is working, but uh, you've put in wrong data inside. You can even deal with complex data. You could, uh, this is a very easy example. You could even uh, say I have optional data, I have a collection of data that consists of arrays and hashes uh, and stuff like that. You can provide information like it's an integer within a certain range. It's a pattern that has a certain pattern inside a string. Or it is just an array or a hash and I'm not re interested in the content at all. So this is the new type system in Puppet 4. Like I mentioned, with great power comes great responsibility. Because there are things that will discontinue to work on your platform by just putting your existing Puppet code into a new Puppet 4 future parser enabled system. Uh, probably, I guess my, my personal guess is 80% of the platforms will fail. Uh, who's doing node inheritance? So having something like a base node configured and just inheriting his, ex new, his real node from that, well, just virtual base node. So no one does node inheritance? Ah, a couple. I see. Yeah, 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 you've got work to do. I'm very sorry for you. Uh, they, okay, okay, yep. Either, either you or uh, Steve, Stephen when being back from, from paternity or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, talk to Puppet Labs, they are happy to help, yeah. Talk to me and my colleague, we are happy to help, yeah. Because why don't we, there is a certain reason why we don't need that node inheritance anymore. First, inheritance also inherits the scope of variables. And I saw even people defining variables on node level, which is absolutely insane. Uh, we now have roles and profiles in place. This is the place where we define variables, declare variables, do data lookup and stuff like that. So there is no need anymore for inheriting from a base node. We can just write a base node profile and have it available on all our systems. So this is an easy fix. Just rewrite your node classification to roles and profiles. When I first talked about the next thing, it was quite interesting. It was uh, in, in London last year, and uh, there was uh, Raphael Pinson from camp to camp there, uh, also many, many modules from, from he, him and his company. Uh, Alessandro Franceschi was there, and when I told them, okay, we will have a slight change. An empty string now no longer compares to false, uh, compares to, an empty string now no longer compares to false, it now compares to true. And they both did a Twitter posting where they immediately said, oh my god, this will break 80% of the modules on the forge. And yes, it will do so. But it's, yeah, but it's, 
But it's it's ill, in lot. We would say, say it's illogical or illogical. It's, it's illogic, definitely. Having an empty string is something. It's an empty string. It's not undef. So why should why should it compare compare to false? It's true. Yes, of course. So I saw stuff like that. People just comparing whether the variable is existent and uh, yeah, empty string. Uh, empty string matches. Uh, yeah, but I don't would like to match it on an empty string. So empty string is now true but I want that one to be to false. So yeah, I have to check that the variable, please, is not an empty string. So next easy fix. Mm -hmm. You're making notes on your homework? Uh, hopefully. I'm very sorry about that. But I'm not finished yet. I'm not really finished yet. No, 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 we're just, we're just starting here. So the next thing we have is variable naming. Um, I saw. I talked to a web developer, and he told me, I looked at his code, we have the review process in place, I uh, just did the Garrett review, and I went to him and said, mm -mm, no, 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 no. Your, your code change is uh, minus two from my side. Do not push that into production. Yes, but, but why? What, what is it that you're not comfortable with? Your variable starts with a capital letter. And he says, yes, but... Uh, a variable inside Puppet can never change. So it's not a variable, it's a constant. And I'm a developer, and writing constants, I'm using capital letters for I immediately seeing it's a constant. I had to tell him, OK, this is a constant from the one node perspective. You were looking at it. But you have many, many nodes. So it is variable amongst a number of nodes. So it is a variable at all from the big Puppet Master perspective, not from your node perspective. So. It was possible having variables with capital letters, and this will break now. A variable may not start with a capital letter and not start with an underscore. Um, the underscore. Yes, it may start with an underscore, but then it's somehow a marker that this is a private variable available in that specific class or define only, and you can't reference it. So when not being totally 100% sure that this is a local variable only, don't use the underscore. Reference namings. I saw very, very interesting stuff how one can build up references, which you might use with uh, either uh, relationship chaining or with the require before subscribe notify pattern. So first thing, capital letter on the title is no longer allowed. So it's the first example underneath. So. It's not working anymore. Um, why is this? Uh, the Puppet parser now tries to evaluate what is there. And you see, OK, I have to evaluate a reference on a class. We omit the empty space. I'll come to that afterwards. Then we have the brackets. And inside the brackets, he sees, oh, there's an expression I have to evaluate. A reference on SSH. Uh, what is SSH? A class? Uh, no, a class is a class. What is SSH? Something undefined in Puppet. So it will break. The next thing is the empty space between the type reference and the title. So again, the parser evaluates, oh, a reference on, uh, on, a, on a type named class and a white space. Uh, mm, finished? So I have to deal with the next expression. So again, no capital letters, letters on titles, no empty white space between the type reference and the title. Well, you can, of course, not fix it, but it will just break your puppet code. Finished? No, not yet. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Who's using hyphens and names? The syslog minus ng module. Uh, only, only one, two, three people are... I suppose I shocked you totally that you are, are afraid of raising your hands by now. So we don't, we don't, we are no longer allowed using hyphens, the minus sign, in names. This reflects to everything you find on the Puppet Master on the file system. A directory name, which is a module name. A class name, which is a file name, or a defined name, which is also a, defined, uh, a file name. So, no longer hyphens and names. Yes, but there is this famous syslog-ng module, because it's called syslog-ng. Yeah, you have to change it. Make the minus sign an underscore. But please do it in all places, in the module definition and in all the module declarations. What I, I was very, very happy that I 
seldomly saw stuff done directly in Ruby. So you had the possibility of writing Ruby code, so you don't have the init.pp, you had the init.rb file. So and Puppet then note, knows, note about, okay, I'm not using my parser, it's just pure Ruby, and uh, I'll just take that bunch of code and throw it somehow into the parser and into the catalog what's inside. And it's almost two years back now the Puppet Labs guys decided no. How should we test this? It's the world of Ruby open to everybody. Uh, we, we cannot somehow deduce the function on, on what is possible or not. It's a, it's a full Ruby world. It's, we don't know what will happen inside there. So they decided, hey, what is it? They took a look on why are people using Ruby manifests anyway? And they learned, yes, because we have to iter iterate over array. We have to split hashes. We have to, yes, but this is by the typed file system. And by having the functions now available, it's built into Puppet DSL. You don't have the need of opening the Ruby world by just purely iterating over an array. That's not all. That's not all. There's more stuff. Uh, so there are also fixes inside, definitely, yes. Um, for example, many people will have recognized when you have a, a module by yourself and you name it my company and you have a MySQL submodule, so it's my company colon colon MySQL, and you somehow want to make use this in this module, you want to use the MySQL upstream module, then you have to put colon colon in front of it. This was due to relative namespace resolution, and this is now fixed in Puppet Lab. So you don't have to use the colon colon. Puppet immediately learns, yes, he's reflecting to the in the module structure to the MySQL module, module and not to the subclass I'm locally in. What else is breaking? Import is gone. I'm so happy that import is gone. Import, yeah, I know many people did it that way, that they had in their site PP, they're importing their nodes slash star dot PP, or even they just said import star star slash star star dot PP, so all structure that is underneath. Uh, that is something that the Puppet Master does itself anyway, so you don't need it in your site PP anymore. Okay. Then I saw people in modules importing other files, where I said, this is insane. Which namespace are we now in when we import a file which has an own class name inside? Uh, we have the auto-loading, we have the module syntax. Why should we use import at all? So I'm very, very happy that it's, it's, it's hor it could break stuff real badly, and the bad thing is you have to analyze, and the analysis is the real, real trouble. So I'm very happy that import is just gone. It's no longer available. Yeah, and some minor stuff like matching numbers with regular expressions. We have types now. Number is of integer or a real. A regular expression is somehow related to a string. How will you compare a, a, an integer to a string? You can't compare it. It's not working. The search function. I seldomly saw the search function. Um, it's gone now. And uh, mutating arrays and hashes, so modifying arrays and hashes. It's, it's, yeah, you, you can use the functions on working on arrays and hashes now. Yeah. Lots of work to do. Yeah. So which brings me, but, but why should I now, I have so much stuff to do. Why should I even think about the idea of moving to Puppet 4? Uh, it's, it's a horrible bunch of work I have to do. So which brings me to the four powers of Puppet 4. The first thing is performance. Um, the benchmark is from the Puppet Labs website. They did some tests with the uh, was was offered uh, was was put online uh, right after PuppetConf last year, or during PuppetConf last year, where they said, okay, we have compared a standard Puppet Master with the new Puppet Server running Clojure on a JVM with JRuby, and they said the the catalog compile times they decrease in sig significantly. Uh, file serving is much more faster. Um, so the whole agent run is even going faster. Um, so yeah, you want to have it because you want to have the performance because you know, like you see in the keynote, we have growing numbers of systems, definitely, and this will continue. And you want to push out the need for an additional puppet master as far as possible. And when you can push out the need for having complex puppet architecture by just switching from puppet version 3 with 
Nginx Apache mod passenger to a JVM, then it's an easy step and I would consider, yes, I'm doing, going for the JVM. It's a far easier change to do than setting up a complete load balanced puppet master setup. How do I do with, deal with the CA by then? Oh, I somehow still need a single system. Huh? The next thing is, which is also related to the JVM, is the scalability. When running on the JVM, I have one configuration file on the Puppet server where I can say enable certain functionality, disable certain functionality. So it's disabled by default and I have to enable it. So I can say over there that master is only responsible for catalog compiling. Over there that master is only responsible for file serving. Over there that master only does the certificate authority. So I just add new servers to them behind an HA proxy and it's okay when a request receives the wrong master, the master says, uh, I'm, I'm not the CA. I don't know how to deal with certificates. Ask the CA, it's over there. So, which makes it easier for scaling, scaling a Puppet Master platform. The third thing is the, I named, I thought about the name, what would be the best name, and I said that the insight is, yeah, not a nice term. Measurability, I don't like the term either, but now it's out on the slide. What do I get from the metrics from the Puppet Master? It's an EL key stack, so Elastic, Lock, Stash, uh, Kibana, uh, where you get an insight on how does your Puppet Master work internally? Do I have any stress situations on the Puppet Master? Within the example, in the lower lane, the center, you see function execution time and you see there's one function which is needs far more longer than anything else so you have it easier for debugging to performance is issues on your puppet master and the last thing is flexibility i don't need to deal with complex templates because i have to iterate and strip out hashes with keys functions and uh, iterate over arrays and stuff like that i can do that natively in the puppet dsl so, okay, Puppet 4, good enough, we want it. Okay, how to do it, how to upgrade. So, it breaks, your, it will probably, maybe not all of your code, but many of your existing code. So please do yourself a favor and not just install it over your Puppet Master and I will fix it while it's been in production. Uh, please read the documentation first, run tests, uh, who's, doing, who's doing Puppet module testing anyway? At least unit testing. So RSpec Puppet. Oh my God. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Three, three or four people are saved to survive the next year here. Yeah. Uh, you, should, you should have a look on RSpec. You should have a look on this the unit testing. You should have a look on integration testing, service spec, beaker. We heard all these terms already. It's really a technology, a way to, to test a module prior you put it somewhere on a Puppet Master. Run it in Jenkins. Let Jenkins run your tests and see whether the module behaves as expected. So when you want to migrate to Puppet 4, please test. There was a discussion on the mailing list. What is the best way? What is the best way? Should we yeah, first do the modules in a way that they are uh, also working on Puppet 4. Should we use the proposed way by downloading the tarball and extracting it and uh, run, run the Puppet Master inside the tarball by specifying the Ruby libdir pointing to the extracted Ruby libdir? And the suggestion was uh, no. Please reinstall a new master. I'm not happy with that solution. I'm Hopefully, I've learned that there will be more stuff after uh, Puppet Enterprise 3.8, which will support you migrating your existing Puppet code to newer Puppet Enterprise versions, which will have, hopefully, Puppet 4 built in. Um, yeah, the other way is you have to test all the stuff by yourself. So, and maybe, who's running a Puppet infrastructure for more than four years? 25 percent. Nice number. Uh, I hope you did take care when setting up your Puppet Master initially, because the certificate authority is in a standard installation valid for five years. So when you want to migrate over to Puppet 4, maybe the easiest way is just install a new Puppet Master with a new certificate authority. So you have the new certificate authority in place and you don't have to deal with the certificate authority no longer being valid. 
when you test your stuff, please do all the module developers a real, real big favor. Um, write pull requests if you have a fix. At least file bug reports. There are so many modules outside. Module developers are yet a little bit unsure how we should deal with that. I don't know how they will do it with the Puppet Forge, that we have existing users that run on Elder Puppet version, and we have users who want to make use of the new functionality of Puppet 4. But which also means we will have to provide two different versions of modules. One that is functional on Puppet 3, one that is functional on Puppet 4 by using new technology of Puppet 4. So please share your, your findings, uh, at least file bug reports. Uh, and maybe it's not that difficult, maybe fix issues by just adding pull requests. Puppet 4 is out, released on April 15th. Uh, so today is 24th, uh, so it's uh, nine days ago. So, so when you are out in the green field, I would recommend right away start with Puppet 4. When you have an existing infrastructure, then you have to migrate. But so, like, like Nigel tomorrow said, uh, to the, today said in the morning, um, it's it's not that it's new doesn't mean it's not mature. So it's working. It's, it's tested because the functionality that is now enabled per default in Puppet 4 has been long already provided by Puppet Labs in the latest three versions. Uh, 3.6 or 3.5 somehow already offered the first versions of the Future Parser. And there are already many companies outside who already make use of the Future Parser. So, and they file bug reports to Puppet saying, okay, this is not working as expected. So it is fixed now. So Puppet Labs now does not say we are offering a new software with new functionality which is not tested no they just say we offer a new version because we switched the we, we switched the, the 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 feature flag from off to on in a default installation that's it that doesn't mean it's not mature so did i came up with all of this by myself one more question So the question has been whether there are already modules out that support Puppet 4, or is there a migration period? It depends on the module developer. Whether It depends also on the Forge. Will the Forge somehow provide a flag that I can push up two versions of the module? It's something where even module developers are waiting for a decision of Puppet Labs how to deal with the Forge. Otherwise, you have to go for, I suppose many developers do it that way, that they already have a branch in the Git repository with a branch where they say, this is Puppet 4 ready code. And we can't push it yet to the Forge because the Forge can only have one version of a module available. So I would take a look on, on all the GitHub repositories and see for modules which I use nowadays, is there already a branch available where they work on being compatible to Puppet 4? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, we, we, still, we, still have, we still have three and a half minutes. Five minutes left, okay. So if someone asks me, okay, uh, where do you find that stuff? Uh, did it all just by yourself? Did you read the Puppet code? How, how much money have you put into Puppet Labs for offering that information here and getting it uh, for tons of beer or stuff like that? No, it's all available on the internet. Uh, Henrik Lindberg, and, and somehow a, let's say, an architect within Puppet, uh, writes a nice blog, regular, irregular, where he offers information on what is it that will come new to Puppet 4. There is a, a, an open Git repository with the Puppet specifications. It's where the development department puts in their information how would, would we like to deal with certain functionality in the new way. So it's the, it's the point where the developers look into what is it that they have to code. So, from a generic description. Uh, camp to Camp has written a night, uh, night blog posting about how to deal with Puppet 4. Um, since it's now out, there's the Puppet 3.7 deprecation reference. Uh, there's the Puppet 4 reference, which is now available. And of course, there is the Welcome Puppet Collections, which means the new way to package stuff, and it's also available in documentation, at least on the blog posting. Okay, I hope I've given you enough work to do. Oh, yeah. 
So I can <clears throat> I actually just checked. We've got metadata support in the Forge modules. If you go look at a module like the apt module, it'll say this one's compatible with 3, 4, and higher. And you can actually go download other versions. So it looks like we've already started pushing out metadata on the Forge modules. So you can tell whether they work with Puppet 4, by its only Puppet 4, or 3 and 4. Nice. Excellent. OK. First of all, did all the rest understand the command? OK. So I will not repeat it. No, we didn't understand. Sorry, no. someone always doesn't understand, but no one's going to say no, it. Not loud. understanding. OK. There was a command regarding the, the, the uh, split up functionality of the Puppet Master. And the command was, when you have a layer 7 load balancer, it's a the communication between agent and server is done via a REST API. So you have certain paths for certain functionality. Within the layer 7 load balancer, you can inside the request and see, OK, which part, path is used in that request. And from the load balancer, you can make a decision. I'm putting that data on for it's all related to certificates. I put it to the CA server. It's files, so I put it to the file serving server. Excellent. Thank and you so much. Last thing was whether there's something like that is already somewhere around in place, and the uh, last comment what, uh, was uh, un unsure, uh, ne never seen so far. <laughs> okay. Thank you so Thank much, you. Martin.